I almost feel like we should be starting this video with me in a smoking jacket holding a cigar. We don't normally do seated videos, but here we are. This is a quick behind the scenes look. I'm pretty excited to show off some in-house stuff we're doing for handling video compression because it's a major problem blowing through hundreds of gigabytes per month and terabytes per year. And also handling backups and automated backups going to our 20 terabyte Synology NAS that I've shown previously. So pretty cool stuff behind the scenes. Before getting to that, this coverage is brought to you by Catalyst Energy Mints. Catalyst says that a three pack of their mints contain the equivalent energy of over 21 energy drinks for $20. Use code GAMERSNEXUS at the link in the description below for 5% off. So let's start with the compression stuff. First of all, on this machine, this is Andrew's rendering station. And we've got a couple of different storage solutions. One, there's a local two disk SSD RAID I think they are HyperX Savage SSDs. So those are in RAID and they are striped. We don't mirror them because it really doesn't matter. The data is not important. The idea is that the entirety of the OS and the host environment lives on the SSDs and all the data is on a separate RAID array, or I should say RAID since it's redundant. Uh, and that is a three disc WD red, uh, maybe four terabyte or something. Yes, yeah, four terabytes total accessible in the RAID and uh, that's a, a RAID 5 setup. So that's what we're working with for the main render machine and this has been shown in the past but what we have that's new is the 20 terabyte NAS which I also very briefly showed but that is being currently used as a sort of it's hosting all the testing methodology all the test results and then for media it's not hosting hosting any of our b-roll or a-roll it's strictly responsible for backing up the finished product. Uh, so the, the problems we face basically with the Z drive, which is our main local to this system storage drive for B-roll, A-roll, all the photography for the website, that's four terabytes just days ago. We were at something like, I don't know, 20, 50 gigabytes, somewhere there, basically nothing left. Uh, we had space for one video, basically. So that was a big problem. Uh, and the issue we faced, as any other media production channel would tell you, was that you don't want to get rid of that footage because it costs money and a lot of time to produce it or to shoot it. And it sucks to kind of just rely on your finished product to go dig out old shots because maybe you don't use the one what you want or you don't remember where it is or something goes wrong. But also keeping around in some cases, I don't know, maybe 40 to 60 gigabytes for something like a teardown plus B-roll is also not ideal. So what do we do? Well, compression seems like the best answer. And I was able to use the Handbrake CLI engine to build a compression routine that basically it, compre it runs through the normal Handbrake CLI EXE. Anyone can do that. And we've got some custom tuning in there, hand tuning through the script that compresses some files about 90% and there's really no visual degradation in quality. Now maybe if you're shooting 4K, but we're shooting 1080-60 and we're not really seeing any real loss in quality. Some of the clips have even been used in recent videos and no one's complained. I don't think I could notice if you blind tested me. So that was pretty carefully uh, tested out for basically bit rate, uh, placebo quality versus actual quality. I tested a few different settings and we decided what worked. So the cool thing, that script, I decided I wanted it to execute recursively on our entire uh, B-roll and A-roll, roll, basically active 2016 folder for videos. And so uh, there's no real good way to do that in Handbrake. You could, but there's issues like not being able to set parameters for uh, what, how old the files can be. And so I went through a a process of building a PowerShell script, which is a Windows, a base Windows utility. And in PowerShell, we can execute this script. And what it does is it targets the folder, which is 2016 in this case, and it runs recursively. And that means that it goes through every single folder in 2016, and it goes through every folder under it, and so on ad infinitum. So we can just sort of CD over to the Z drive, Z2016, and once we're there, you do uh, the PowerShell command to run a script, which is and space quotations, and then z colon slash 2016 slash steve compress edit.ps1. We hit enter, and that'll start executing. 
And uh, we've already compressed about 3,000 files this way, I think, maybe a little less. 2,000 to 3,000. Right now it says there's, it's on file one out of 1141. And it's pretty cool. I've got it set up so that it spits out a percentage of the total files. So that's something you can create in the script. You can go in and tell it, hey, produce a percentage of how far you are through all of the files recursively that you're processing. So it's telling us it's less than 1% done. And uh, then it's executing the handbrake functions, it's detecting how many CPU cores we have, or threads in this case, and going through uh, different libraries, determining which video files it can and can't compress. And the parameters for that are basically, it has to be an MTS file, which is what our camera produces. It will not compress MP4s. That's important because we don't want to compress our final product. We want to leave those fully uncompressed at their original output. So it's only compressing MTS files out of the camera. And then after that, it is only compressing those if they are 90 days old or older. So anything shot in the last three months does not get compressed just in case we're not done with the video or we need regular access to those files. For, uh, for example, if we're talking about GPUs, the RX 480 and GTX 1060, both of those were done, I think, three months or more ago at this point. But if we are uh, producing videos still with them, it's good to kind of hang on to some stuff that was shot more recently for either uh, B-roll or advertisements or whatever we're doing. So that's all uh, being compressed through this script and it goes through and uh, it's, it's found one to work on. It tells us what percent through that encoding task it is, which is 70% right now, 74, 77 and tells us the frame rate at which it is compressing the estimated time of completion and uh, then it, it saves to a log file and says if it succeeded or not. And if the compression did not succeed, there's another check in there that I had support from Jim Vincent who helps us somewhat regularly and Patrick Lathan who helps us somewhat regularly both in programming functions. Uh, there's a check I had them help me with where the PowerShell script basically looks at the uh, output from the last task that was completed because Handbrake can speak to basic Windows functions. It outputs a zero or a one based on if the uh, compression succeeded or failed. And so if it puts out a failure, then the, oh, I didn't even explain this part yet. If it puts out a failure, the old file is not deleted. And that's the part I didn't explain. So for compression, obviously does us no good if all we're doing is compressing the video and creating a second file. Uh, all that does is add to your storage usage. So uh, what our script does is it compresses these sometimes four gigabyte files down to a couple hundred megabytes, massive difference. And then if the check says this succeeded, this task succeeded in its function, it will delete the old file. And if it doesn't succeed, it leaves it there. And I go check it manually later to see what happened, which that hasn't happened yet. But uh, if it does, we've got a safety check in there. So that's executing right now. That uses, as you will see, full 100% CPU load. It does not care about the GPU at all. Uh, eats a bit of RAM, but most of that is Premiere Open in the background, I think. And then the Z drive gets hammered because it's, it's executing nonstop, either writing or reading files. Uh, so that's what the script does. That's one thing. We're going to go ahead and cancel that with some Control Cs. And this will run. I need to still catch up through the 1,100 files we have. But once it's done compressing all of those, I'm going to set it up to execute on a task scheduler probably once a month overnight or something like that. Um, and that'll be a completely hands-free maintenance for the system, for the business. The Z drive, we look at it now, we're up to about 600 gigabytes free. And originally, when this started, like I said, we were less than 50 gigabytes. So this has clawed back for us about 500 gigabytes of space, and it's basically free other than the power bill for running the CPU at 100% load 24-7 for a few days. But basically free. I didn't have to drive, buy more drives. Uh, and then we want to utilize the NAS, of course, too. So what do we do with that? Well, that's the Synology NAS, uh, the DS, whatever it is, 1515 Plus or something like that. It's, it's, a, uh, it's four terabyte disks by five. So it's a five disk array, all four terabytes, and it's in a, uh, a hybrid RAID setup. That's built by Synology, but it's not really being utilized. So I wanted to fix that. And the way to do that first was to go into Task Scheduler, which I just said we're going to use for PowerShell shortly uh, for the, uh, the Handbrake script. 
And in task scheduler, we have this task right now that's running every Sunday, every two weeks. So it runs twice a month on Sundays at 5.45 a.m. when probably no one's working and there's probably not an embargo lift the next day. There's normally on Tuesdays. So that wasn't a concern. So we go into task scheduler. This is a basic Windows utility, just like PowerShell is. And I would wager that probably most people don't even know that at least one of those two exists on their computer. And they are crazy powerful. So uh, task scheduler, we can right click the one I created, go to properties. And the general is it backs up finished files from our finished directory in this, on this local machine and it sends them over the local network at a gigabit per second, which is about 111 megabytes per second, to the NAS. And we keep, we retain both copies, one here, one there. And then the really cool thing is the NAS then takes that content. I think it does this, I think it does it at 5.45 a.m. every night. It takes that content and it uploads it straight to a uh, backup online drive that we have your run-of-the-mill backup company. So they're, they're completely safe in, we have them in three locations, two local and then one remote because it's not a backup if both copies are local. That's not, it's not good. Um, so that's how that works. And the, the script is very simple for doing this copy. So what we want to do, Synology does not have a good solution to do this built into their NAS. They have several solutions that are kind of partway there but I didn't like any of them. I felt like a really basic batch file would work better. So we go to triggers and you right click it. Uh, you can see the trigger is weekly. So it fires weekly every two weeks on Sundays. And then the action is to start a file or a program. This is a script I made. It's very basic. Pretty much anyone can make it. You go to, uh, we're going to open that script. It's in the C drive and then script and then robocopy. Uh, finished 2016.bat. There's a batch file that executes basically in command. And we can open that in Notepad++. And this really isn't a trade secret or anything. This is really basic Windows functions. Um, so RoboCopy is a command line function in Windows. It executes. It automatically copies from location A to location B with a set of parameters. And several of the parameters we want are already enabled by default. So it's a really simple line. It's like 68 characters long or something, or 68 uh, columns long. Yeah, 68 columns long. And uh, so RoboCopy from Z2016 finished to Y finished 2016. I know, backwards formatting, whatever. Uh, but that's the NAS. And uh, then we are excluding a few things, and we're copying the files, and we're not mirroring. So that means that if a file is deleted on the NAS, it won't be deleted here and vice versa. And in some ways mirroring is good, but I just didn't want it because sometimes we change stuff last minute and I didn't want to have issues. Uh, so that's the RoboCopy. That does all that stuff for us. And then the last part is the uh, Synology setup where it auto uploads everything using the Synology uh, drive, whatever it is, cloud proxy drive or something like that. And you select your drive service, whether that's Dropbox or Amazon or uh, Rackspace, Backblaze, all those people. You select one of those, put in your credentials. We encrypt the uploads uh, both directions and I limit them to a certain data rate so that it does not eat into our data rate here if we wanted to upload an actual video to YouTube. So I think I limit it to something like really slow, like two megabytes per second, and it just sort of spins overnight. And then the rest of the data is left for our normal uploads for YouTube because we don't want to slow those down. So that's the, the behind the scenes, not quite so quick, but I think that gives a, a pretty cool look at what we've been working on lately to deal with these challenges that you probably don't think about on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, storage is a massive issue and uh, I don't want to keep everything on the NAS. I kind of like having stuff local to work on. We'll probably move that direction in the future, but I would rather build a server than a NAS. And then we use the NAS more for backups, for testing data from all the seven or eight different test machines and test methodology, which is really important to have access to everywhere, which also automatically uploads encrypted to our online backup solution. So I think that, that about covers it. As always, links in the description below. Patreon link in the postal video helps out directly. Thank you to our Patreon backers for enabling this type of stuff because this is, uh, it's not that time consuming to do some of it, 
but the testing for the handbrake script was reasonably time consuming and obviously it does it does suck to kind of burn time on stuff that feels like it's not producing content even though it's really uh really important from a business standpoint to do uh, but thank you to the for the support subscribe for more i'll see you all next time